You guys sound wonderful. Please be seated. That was awesome. Good morning, church. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here. You know, it's a little tougher when it uh, is beautiful weather outside, um, like today, to get up in the morning, right? All you want to do is just stay in bed, right? Um, especially when you have little ones, you know, you're like, oh, man, getting them dressed and getting them ready and all that. But uh, I remember when I was a young Christian, uh, a friend of mine and I, we studied out the Bible, and uh, he was, he was really, he's a really cool dude. Uh, long hair, like a rocker dude, and yeah, totally like a prophet, this guy. And he, he studied out with me, he said, you know what? Prayer and song. That's how he talks. Uh, e, you know, um, it's like incense going to the Lord. And I was like, wow. And then we studied it out in the Old Testament, and it's so cool. It really is true. Um, so just know that you're singing and your prayer and worship this morning is going up to the Lord as incense. It's awesome. Amen. Um, also, we are a Bible-based church, uh, so I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures this morning. Feel free to just jot them down, go home, have a quiet time, pray on them, read them, um, because I, I don't want you to get frustrated with me, uh, as I'm just, my, I might already be at the next scripture when you're trying to, you know, do this, and then you're looking at me like, ah, and then I see Bibles flying like this, you know, that we don't, so just write them down, you know, uh, and I'll, we'll start the PowerPoint presentation now, guys. I have my, uh, my guys in the back there. But yeah, there we go. All right. So we're studying out the Lord's Prayer, um, and today we're going to talk about your kingdom come. Uh, the prayer starts with, hallowed be your name, right? And we talked about that last week, and today we're going to talk about your kingdom come. What is a kingdom? Well, it has a king, and it has subjects. That's the simple form of a kingdom. Jesus is teaching us that we ought to pray for God's kingdom to come, right? Yep, your kingdom come. What is God's kingdom? Naturally, we can study out God's kingdom in where? The Bible. It's awesome. There's so many answers in the Bible. Uh, it's study, uh, you know, if we were to study it all out together, would take us like weeks, maybe months. It's crazy how much is out there about God's kingdom, the interpretations, uh, the different books that were written about it. And it's, it's overwhelming, quite frankly. Um, but I'm going to try to narrow it down to three simple things that hopefully we can remember as we pray your kingdom come. Amen? Good. Um, now, some people believe God's kingdom is heaven or will be established when Jesus comes back. In all these beliefs, there are some fundamental things that we can learn from the Bible. And that's what we're going to look at today. Turn on my clicker here. There we go. All right. Should have done that earlier. Boom. Good. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, reads uh, in verse 20 to 21. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Oh, here it is. Oh, there it is. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is amongst us. It's in our midst. We humans like to see physical things, don't we? We like to have things that we can, you know, uh, grasp onto. Uh, we, if we see it, we believe it, right? If it's right there, you know, that's why magic tricks just blow our minds, right? It's like, whoa, you know, because I didn't see you just taking the card and sliding it up your sleeve. You know what I mean? You were too fast for my eyes. That's amazing, right? You're a magician, you know, and we're like, whoa. Um, we love when we can see it. Have you ever watched a show on Netflix? Don't, if, you, if you love magic, don't watch it because you'll see all the tricks. Or, you know, this guy has like a mask on because I guess they would like excommunicate him from the magic community. Uh, but he tells you all the tricks, right? And you watch it and you're like, this is such a letdown. Like, I love magic. This is not cool. You know, that's how simple this trick is, right? We love when we see things right in front of us. In Mark chapter 8, verse 11, it says this. Pharisees come to Jesus and ask for a sign from heaven. It reads that Jesus, oh, no, that's not what it says. Um, this is what it says. Um, the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask for a sign from heaven. It reads that Jesus sighed deeply. He said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. And that's it, isn't it? We want to see it right in front of us. In John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29, uh, we see Thomas, and the disciples basically come to Thomas, and they tell him, we saw the Lord, you know, and Thomas is like, um, uh, nope, 
unless I see him with my own eyes, right, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe it, right? And, and Jesus basically appears to Thomas and says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We have been brought up from little, all the babies in the crowd here, right? This is what we learn is our senses. We have five senses. Um, and it's hard for us to believe anything that our senses can't confirm, right? We want to touch, we want to smell, we want to taste, we want to see, you know. Uh, Jesus says that blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That is really hard. Here's, here's how I know that this is really hard. So a little while ago, um, I worked for the Eagles, and uh, we had a, um, uh, a group uh, for the directors of the organization, the vice presidents, and all sorts of executive offices. We had a, a group outing where uh, seeing-eye dogs came, and uh, we learned all about seeing-eye dogs from a gentleman who was blind himself, and he has dog with him, right? So, the, you know, the first five minutes, we all had to get over how cute the dog was before we started listening to him, right? And he knows that, so he kind of jokes around a little bit. Uh, but then later, uh, we had to go upstairs in our club level, and they had a whole bunch of seeing-eye dogs, and they blindfolded us, and they set up chairs and, you know, like total obstacles, right? And they were like, now you're going to grab onto this dog, and he's going to lead you through these obstacles, right? And you're thinking, all right, yeah, no problem. You know, that's kind of cool, right? That is crazy, because here's what happens. So they blindfold you, and you know, already when you're blindfolded, you're like, eh, you know, I don't, you know what I mean? All right, you know, you grab onto this dog, and it's not like the dog goes like half a mile an hour. This dog literally is like, ah, right? I mean, it is like three miles an hour. You're like, oh, oh, you know, and when you're blindfolded, no way. I mean, I was like this. They had a video of me going like this, you know, like, ah, and, and screaming, right? And he said, the dog kept looking up at you, you know, it's like, just trust me, you know? If that's how hard it is to trust the dog, that's crazy. I was so not in my element, you know? It was crazy. I took off the blindfold and I was like, wow, I get it. God is asking us to believe, you know? That's not so easy. It's easy when you have your senses and you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I believe, no problem. I have faith, right? But man, when the going gets tough, right? We know, we know those moments, right? When you come back and you're like, oh, this could have been a victory of faith. And I, it wasn't, you know? But especially if it goes against our senses. You have to trust. And that's really hard. Because why? It's not something we naturally have learned from the moment we opened our eyes into this world. But it is so powerful. Uh, and in fact, I'm a huge Star Wars geek. Anyone seen the new trailer? Yeah. Like, so awesome. Do you guys see Darth Vader's mask? Okay, well, all right, I'm not gonna. Um, but anyways, so I, I love Star Wars, you know, and you just, you know, I think it's so cool that in like real life, I have the force. Like, that's awesome. For anyone who doesn't know Star Wars, they have like the force, right? And the force is something that you can like move mountains. Guess what? The Bible says you have faith. Small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. It's like, man, for real, we have the force. That's awesome, right? Um, I'm digressing. But um, I think it's so cool. Um, Jesus tells us that the kingdom is in our midst. It's within us. It's something that we can't see. It's something that we can't touch, we can't taste, we can, you know, it goes against our senses, but it's in the midst of us. When you make a decision, when we make a decision to accept Jesus into our life as our Lord and Savior, and we are baptized, the Bible teaches us that we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says this, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you. Isn't that amazing how some religions just leave that out and be baptized, right? Repent, yes, and believe, and you'll be saved. It says right here, repent and be baptized. Those two things, every one of you, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit residing within us makes us part of something bigger. It makes us part of God's kingdom. 
The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a deposit. In 2 Corinthians 5, 5, told you there was a lot of scriptures. Uh, now the one who has fashioned us for his very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Isn't that cool? God's like, I'm going to put this right inside of you, and that's your key right there. That is the deposit guaranteeing of what is to come. It takes faith. The Holy Spirit unifies us. Uh, outwardly, we're all very different. Um, inwardly, however, if we have the Holy Spirit, we have something that unifies us all. Uh, we all now become subjects of God's kingdom. A kingdom not only has a king and subjects, but it also um, has rules that everyone lives by. Correct? Right? Um, when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying that as a kingdom, um, it, it'll be more and more a part of our reality, right? Of our daily lives. In fact, it is uh, it, when we become subjects in God's kingdom, we uh, decide to obey what is written in the Bible and live according to its teachings. Pretty simple, right? We also acknowledge uh, God and Jesus as king in the, in the moral choices that we have to make in everyday life, right? What would Jesus do? You know, uh, what would Jesus do in this situation? You know, let me pray about this because what I want to do is something doesn't go against, it goes against the Bible. I should do what the Bible says, right? That's what we decide in our lives to do. Those are the rules we live by. We commit to change in our lives. Change is not easy. You know, it's not something that we enjoy. But the Bible says that suffering produces perseverance, right? Perseverance character, you know, and character hope. That'll not disappoint us. Uh, that we will acknowledge him as king in the circumstances and relationships of our lives. Everything we do, we acknowledge Jesus, our Lord, as King and Savior. And that we will live lives fitting for members of the kingdom of the King of Kings. Now there's a second item that we pray for when we pray your kingdom come. So the first one really is, it's in our midst, it's the Holy Spirit, it combines us. We all decide to live in God's kingdom. Amen? Make sense to everyone? Yes? There's a second thing. And when we pray, your kingdom come. The first one we just talked about was inwardly, our hearts, our resulting actions, the Holy Spirit. The second one is more outward focused. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says this. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 31, the second part, it says, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Right? There is a repentance. There is a belief. There is an action. John chapter 3 verse 3 says this. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. There are many more scriptures that talk about the kingdom of God as something to be proclaimed, something that has to be talked about, something that has to be just shared with the nations, right? Um, for people to come into God's kingdom. Uh, we're praying that outsiders will hear that message. Your kingdom come. Part of that prayer is, I want outsiders to hear this message. I want them to join up, right? Uh, to hear the message, to believe, and to do what? Repent and be baptized. To enter the kingdom, to believe in the good news of Christ. Amen? In Mark chapter 4, verse 30, I already alluded to this, but this is how small mustard seeds are, right? The smallest of seeds, again he said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 30, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shades. Isn't that cool? When you pray your kingdom come, you are praying for that seed to be planted, to grow into a huge garden, for birds to perch in its shade. From one person to many people, to a whole nation, joining the faith. That's what you pray for when we pray, your kingdom come. I love this scripture. 
Not to digress, but a small seed is so vulnerable, isn't it? Um, and when it grows into a big tree, it's much harder to deal with, isn't it? That's why it's so powerful when that message goes through the whole nations, right? It's so powerful when we are many, you know? It doesn't feel weird to be in here and sing and stand there with your hands up. If you do it by yourself, it can get a little embarrassing. But when we're all together here, it doesn't feel embarrassing. Why? Because we're unified. It's powerful. And when people come in here, they see, wow, this is different, right? When we pray, your kingdom come, it means outsiders as well. It means for that seed to be planted. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says this, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, from darkness to light. That is what we pray for when we pray, Your kingdom come. It is shining a light on a dark place. Turn on the light. Amen? So we pray for us in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, and we pray for those who are lost when we pray, your kingdom come. There is a third aspect we pray for. Many believe that God's kingdom will come in physical form. Uh, as I mentioned before, in fact, whole religions are based on this, right? In Genesis 3 and onward, we see the anticipation of God's kingdom coming, right? And whole religions believe that it'll start in Jerusalem, it'll be a physical kingdom, right? And only God's chosen people will be allowed to enter it. There is some problem with this, though. The Bible talks about a heavenly kingdom. Uh, in Daniel 4.3, it says this, How great, how great are his signs. How mighty his wonders. His kingdom, and here it comes, is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. It's not something that can wither away. It's eternal. It'll last forever. It talks about God's kingdom being an eternal kingdom, not a physical kingdom that can be destroyed with weapons. Uh, Psalms 103.19 says this, The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. Where has the Lord established His throne? In heaven. Not on earth. In heaven. And that's in the Old Testament. That's powerful. Here it clearly talks about God's kingdom residing where? In heaven. That's where God sits and his kingdom rules over all. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, it reads this. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. God's kingdom is imperishable. It'll never wane, fade, or anything. Uh, if it were a kingdom on earth, it, that, that can't be true because definitely flesh and blood is on planet earth, right? It's made up of humans, the populace on earth, right? We are humans. We're made up of flesh and blood. God's kingdom is not made up of that. So if we were subject in God's kingdom and it was on earth, that wouldn't work. Do you agree? Amen. Three of you agree. That's great. Some of you are like, well, you know. Um, we'll talk later. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with what? Reverence and awe and awe. It's powerful. Your kingdom come, right? It's our hearts. It's inside of us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's those who are lost, and it is a heavenly kingdom beyond our imagination, right? I mean, just imagine our brother Bob, what he's doing right now. Is he surfing on sound waves? I don't know. Is that even possible? It probably is in heaven, right? How awesome. How awesome. With awe. It cannot be shaken. It's heavenly and therefore earth's powers cannot destroy it. Even science tells us that this planet earth is going to die one day. 
It might take a billion years, but we are moving ever so closer to the sun. And one day, it's going to be... <laughs> it is, right? You may be like, well, I have faith that maybe God can move the planet back, and then we will... No! Wow! Your faith is stronger than mine. That's amazing. We are going like this. That's it, right? Hey, we will not experience it. It'll be in a billion years, sure. Maybe Jesus will come back before then, right? But eventually it's going to happen. So a kingdom on earth cannot be forever. Even science agrees with that. Revelations chapter 12, verse 12 says this. I'm getting a little bit more gloomy here. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He knows. He knows this is not going to last. You know, today, um, so I, you drive down Westchester Pike, right? And the streets are good, you know. But uh, just after four hours of raining, you see little streams, right? I mean, you see little boats that some kids made and it's like going down a stream, right? It's amazing, you know what I mean? That's just after four hours. What if it rains 40 days and 40 nights? Yes, we would need an ark because we would be underwater. You know, it's amazing how quickly natural disaster can just take it all. You know, this planet is volatile, you know, uh, and it's not going to last. And Satan knows this. He knows. He knows. Do you know? He knows this time is short. Do we know? Just like this earth will pass away one day, Satan's time is short as well. Why would we want a physical kingdom on earth? You know, why on earth? Get it? Right. I, I had to put that in. Why on earth would we want a physical kingdom? Oh, so proud of myself. Um, <laughs> and we will be susceptible. We will be, as human beings, we are just susceptible to Satan's attacks. We are. We are physical beings of flesh and blood. Wouldn't you much rather be a heavenly being, be in heaven, be far away from all this, right? I don't want a physical kingdom. I want a heavenly kingdom, amen? One that will last forever. I've preached about this before. We try to make things so nice on planet Earth, right? They sell you paradise, you know? Our dealership is called Paradise. Buy this car and you will have a slice of paradise, you know? No, you won't. Because after five years, that thing's going to start to break down. And it won't be paradise, you know? It's amazing. We try to make this paradise, right? Take book your vacation today to Jamaica, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's just like here, just like anywhere else, right? You drive upstate uh, New York, Pennsylvania. It's gorgeous, right? But not when a storm comes through. Not when there's an earthquake, right? It's so volatile, you know? Um... There's so much pain on this planet. Money, greed, it's all at the root of things. Uh, but God's promise of, heaven, of a heavenly kingdom is salvation from all of this. Some call it a pipe dream. I call it faith. God gives us a choice. What we do with that choice is up to us. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 says this. The seventh trumpet, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. That's awesome. That's what I want to be part of. Do you want to be part of that church? Do you want to be part of heaven, church? Amen. Amen. This is the kingdom we wait for patiently. For this kingdom we wait for the ultimate coming of God's kingdom, we pray. When we pray, your kingdom come. All of this and more we are praying for when we pray, your kingdom come. It is a powerful prayer. When we pray, your kingdom come, we pray for a kingdom that cannot be seen, but is in our midst. It's within us. We are part of it. And we are part of it because of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Your kingdom come. We pray for that to convert the lost, to join this kingdom. From a small mustard seed to a large plant. A powerful kingdom, strong in numbers. When we pray your kingdom come, 
We pray for a heavenly kingdom. A kingdom that will last for all eternity. A powerful heavenly kingdom, not earthly, where rust and moth destroy. The ultimate kingdom where God will reign forever and ever. Amen, church? When we pray, your kingdom come, we have to ask ourselves, do we truly desire this authority in our lives? Do we truly take action in sharing our faith, in helping this prayer come to fruition? Do I really believe that I will be in heaven one day with the Lord Almighty? That's what we pray for when we pray, your kingdom come. It's a powerful prayer, one not to be taken lightly, but one that will change this world forever. Amen. To God be the glory.